the magician will now attempt a dangerous trick that's not for the faint of heart or stomach. If you have an aversion to the sight of scary tricks, now's the time to look away. The climate denial industry is reliant on a kind of magic. The ability of professional deceivers to create an illusion that settled science is somehow unsettled. That certainty is somehow uncertain. And even in some cases, selecting and distorting real scientific research and making it appear to say exactly the opposite of what it says. A perfect example is this widely quoted canard best exemplified in The Great Global Warming Swindle, a 2007 movie that's become the hysterically bonkers bible of the climate denial movement. Here we're looking at the ice core record from Vostok, and in the red we see temperature going up from early time to later time at a very key interval when we came out of a glaciation. And we see the temperature going up, and then we see the CO2 coming up. CO2 lags behind that increase. It's got an 800 year lag. So temperature is leading CO2 by 800 years. So the fundamental assumption, the most fundamental assumption of the whole theory of, of climate change due to humans is, is shown to be wrong. So the movie claims to cite Antarctic ice cores to pretend that somehow, somewhere, actual data contradicts the overwhelming mainstream consensus about global climate change. Today, together, you and I are going to learn the rest of the story. Ever since scientists realized that the Earth's ice sheets have expanded and contracted many times over the last three million years, they have wondered what would possibly have been the cause of these grand climatic cycles. They're reasonably sure it's not because of this. By the 1970s, several peer-reviewed studies confirmed the current view that long-term changes in Earth's orbit and rotation have been the timer, the initial forcing that moves the planet into and out of glacial periods. They were named Milankovitch factors, after Milutin Milankovitch, the Serbian mathematician who first advanced the theory. There are three main factors. The first one is precession. This refers to slow change in the direction of the Earth's axis of rotation, much like a rotating top. The process takes about 22,000 years. The second is obliquity, the subtle change in the angle of the axial tilt, from 22.1 degrees to 24.5 degrees which occurs over about 41,000 years. The third is eccentricity, in which the shape of the Earth's orbit changes from nearly circular to more elliptical or egg-shaped over about 100,000 years. Paleoclimate expert Richard Alley gave a clear demonstration of one of these effects in recent testimony before the U.S. Congress. Good question. There have been these back and forth between uh, on glaciers and the melting that we've seen over and over again. Uh, why did it happen then if these same factors that you're blaming it on didn't exist then? Um, I can give you as much or as little answer as that you would like. Um, give me 15 seconds. Please. Okay, g give me 30 if I may. Okay, um, the ahead. ice ages are caused by features of Earth's orbit. Your brightness is the sun. This is the Earth. I, this is the equator. Here is the North Pole. Yes. If the North Pole stood straight up, you could I, never give me a sunburn on my bald spot. But in I, fact, as you know, it is tipped over a little bit. And it nods a little more and a little less over 41,000 years. Now, when it nods more, right. my bald spot ice melts and the right. um, equator is a little more shaded and now the ice grows and now the ice melts. But it takes 41,000 years for this change to happen. We know what that's doing right now and it's not fast no, enough no, to explain to what say, we're seeing. Tell me all of the, uh the cycles sometimes work together and sometimes cancel each other out. But the end result is, about every 100,000 years, the planet goes into 
and out of a glacial period, what many people call an ice age. The Milankovitch forces moved the planet out of the last glacial period starting about 20,000 years ago. In the absence of human interference, another major cooling event would not be expected for at least 20 or 30,000 years. But the theory was incomplete. The orbital forcings are very weak. Scientists needed to show how such tiny perturbations could create huge global effects. During the 1980s and 90s, scientists like James Hansen of NASA and others worked to understand how such a relatively weak forcing could cause the kind of major global changes that would produce large planetary effects. They understood that other factors were at work to amplify small changes. For instance, increases in snow and ice cover increase the reflection of heat, amplifying a weak orbital cooling. But how could changes taking place primarily in the northern hemisphere be spread over the whole planet? The missing link, they said, was the increased warming of water and soils releasing greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. Hansen and his group wrote in 1990, changes in CO2 and methane content have played a significant part in the glacial interglacial climate changes by amplifying the relatively weak orbital forcing and by constituting a link between northern and southern hemisphere climates. To prove the truth of this sequence of changes, Hansen and his team called for more ice core studies and more accurate measurements. It is these very studies that have given us enough detail to show that Hansen was right about greenhouse gas effects. And these very studies are the ones deniers have chosen to cherry pick and distort. Those who have watched this series for a while know that I always like to go to the source of any claim that climate deniers make. In this case, a study by Nicolas Caillon, published in Science in March of 2003, which of course will actually read. It's titled, Timing of Atmospheric CO2 and Antarctic Temperature Changes Across Termination 3. Termination 3 refers to the warming that brought the planet out of a previous glacial period 240,000 years ago. What the graph shows is good support for Milankovitch theory as well as Hansen's prediction. Orbital factors begin a long, slow warming trend which causes the outgassing of CO2 and methane from oceans and soils, reinforcing and amplifying the weak orbital warming and creating dramatic global change. The study says, the sequence of events is in full agreement with the idea that CO2 plays, through its greenhouse effect, a key role in amplifying the initial orbital forcing. And, the situation at termination 3 is different from recent anthropogenic CO2 increase. We should distinguish between internal influences, such as the deglacial CO2 increase, and external influences, such as the anthropogenic CO2 increase on the climate system. Although the recent CO2 increase has clearly been imposed first as a result of anthropogenic activities, it naturally takes, at termination 3, some time for CO2 to outgas from the ocean once it starts to react to a climate change that is first felt in the atmosphere. And finally, the sequence of events during this termination is fully consistent with CO2 participating in the latter 4200 years of the warming. The radiative forcing due to CO2 may serve as an amplifier of the initial orbital forcing, which is then further amplified by fast atmospheric feedbacks that are also at work for the present day and future climate. Could the authors have made it any clearer? In fact, Nicolas Caillon has moved on to other fields. And the de facto corresponding author on this paper is Jeff Severinghaus of the Scripps Oceanographic Institute. Responding to my email, Dr. Severinghaus graciously took time from his schedule to review the earlier version of this video. He gave me permission to display his response.
So let's review. We know that orbital forces have not acted significantly in 10,000 years, nor will they for another 30,000. We know that the Sun has not been a significant factor in the last 50 years. We've seen how James Hansen and his team predicted the interplay of orbital effects and greenhouse gases 10 years before the actual data became available. And we've seen how the very study climate deniers hope you won't read is used to twist and distort the debate when in fact it proves how well climate scientists have understood and predicted greenhouse effects. The majority of climate deniers are unknowing pawns who have been manipulated by fear and ignorance to continue spreading a few carefully crafted propaganda memes. As I've studied this debate, the wonder has been, always and always, the depths of dishonesty and cynicism that are common practice among the paid professional denier community. Let's continue to cut through the ignorance and spread the truth right here at Climate Denial, Crock of the Week. Time. A dabba do time, we'll have a gay old time. 